Hello, everybody. I'm so super excited about this uh, episode because this is one of my favorite, favorite topics to talk about. And of course, I am joined here with Ava from Queen Midas, Life Alchemist, right? That's your title, right? Yes, and then, of course, is. Stephanie from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening. And the topic that we're going to talk about is something Stephanie and I have been briefly speaking about. And of course, I've spoken about this a lot because this is my life. This is my job outside of YouTube, as well as Ava's, which we're going to get to in a minute. And that is exercises spirituality. And that's something that I think in the Western world, as we were chatting off camera, since the three of us are Westerners, that we don't really understand. And it's taken me many, many years, 15 years to be exact on my yoga mat to really truly understand what, what's happening physically when we move our body. And that the physical body is something that's very spiritual. It's as our friend Cindy says, and it's true, it's the Shakti of the soul. It's the expression of the soul. Our body holds information, um, both good and bad. It holds energy, uh, bondage that needs to be released. And you, of course, are the only one that can do that. And I know you guys have heard me speak about this a lot on my channel through yoga, but and you obviously you guys know Stephanie, because we did a um, episode on the doshas and we talked a lot about exercise. Now, before I get into Ava telling her awesome story, I want to just give you guys a head up. I've gotten so much positive feedback uh, regarding our dosha episode, both my episode with Catherine Edwards and with Stephanie. And so many people have asked me questions about their diet and all that kind of stuff. Um, the thing, again, I want to clarify about the doshas is that every single person's diet is going to be a little bit different. So for example, because I'm Vata Pitta, because that is my, my, my disposition. I have a little bit, tiny little bit of kapha, but it's not enough to really count. So what I have to do in my diet is pull up the kapha energy by eating kapha foods. Now, somebody asked me in the comment section that they were bought to kapha. They were confused because I was eating more kapha foods. Well, no, your diet's going to be different because you're bought to kapha. You're missing the pitta. And so that's going to be true. Now for people like Stephanie who are tridosha, sometimes that makes it even harder to balance because you have to find where the missing links are to then create that balance. And so for me specifically, I cannot help people that I don't know personally with this. Um, I have to know you, I have to know your habits, all that kind of stuff. So I can't give you a diet plan. Uh, it's going to be specific just to you. So if that's something you're interested in, just Google or you can use Google. Google's fine for this. Just Google Ayurvedic Clinic in your area. Now, if you live in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, you might not have an Ayurveda clinic. Uh, you might have to go to the nearest city to do that. They're also going to take your pulse. They're also going to look into your eyes. They're also going to look at your tongue. Uh, they're going to ask you questions about your sleeping pattern, stuff that you can't do over a Zoom, that you have to actually be face-to-face -to, -face to get a better idea. The doctor will get a better idea of what, what's, your, what's happening with your energy cycle. And so please, I can't give you any advice on what to eat or how to eat. You really need to be seeing an Ayurvedic practitioner yourself. It's worth it. If you make the drive, it's totally worth it because it will change your life. Um, somebody asked me too, they said they found something, but it looked like there was a shop attached. Yes, most Ayurveda clinics will have a shop in their clinic where they sell products that they like, right? And Catherine and I have spoken about this a lot of times with oils. I know, Stephanie, we talked about this um, sometimes, especially here in the West. The products we get, like castor oil, coconut oil, isn't actually the legit stuff. And so a lot of Ayurveda clinics will import stuff from India or import certain oils or certain mushrooms or certain um, vitamins from India or from places where they know the product is good. That's why there's a shop attached. Most Ayurvedic doctors I know, though, will not force you to buy from them. They just have it on hand in case you need it or you want it. Okay. So that's not their main focus is selling you stuff. Their main focus is to treat you. So, um, so don't be turned off by the fact there's a shop attached. As I told someone, I love the fact that the Ayurveda clinic here in Atlanta has a shop attached because I haven't been able to go to India in a couple of years. And that's normally where I get all my castor oil. So I can just go there and get what I need from them. And they're not going to try to sell you anything that doesn't apply to your energy cycle. Right? So because I'm a Vata, they're not going to try to sell me ca uh, coconut oil because coconut oil is terrible for me. Right they're, they're they're so so don't be turned off by that okay, um, it's like most clinics will have products of what they they like you know um, that makes sense to me I as a yoga teacher I always tell people to buy a manduka mat I don't sell manduka mats but manduka mats the best in my opinion so that's what I tell my students that's what I use you know it makes sense right that's what um, 
what they would do. So I just want to clarify that. Please, please, please find a practitioner yourself that can help you through this process. I cannot do it for you. So, all right. With that being said, Ava, is this <laughs> the second time you've been on my channel or first? Uh, no, second. second. Yeah. Oops. Sorry, guys. That was my, my reminder that we were filming today. Because as you guys <laughs> see, I'm still not in Atlanta. So I, third time filming from your bed. Third time right. filming from my bed. I'm still, I'm still not making what porn stars make, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are so proud of me. No. Um, but anyway, so Ava, you are like me. Were you... Um, before YouTube, before um, this great awakening, you were working as a personal trainer. You're also a dancer too, correct? But you were also working as a personal trainer. So can you share a brief story of your journey through exercise? Yes. So uh, I actually started out in healthcare. So my undergrad was in clinical laboratory science. I was a medical technologist for about two and a half, three years. And um, when I found my way back to a hospital in Dallas. I met a guy and we were dating and he actually had guest privileges to a club that was there. So I started to, um, I'd get off work. I worked overnight and I'd get off and I started taking cycling and Western yoga and Pilates. And, um, I start. I loved it because I was moving my body and uh, Mind you, I had been an athlete since seventh grade. So I was in, I played volleyball for 15 years, soccer for seven. I was a cheerleader. Um, I ran track. I played rugby in college. Um, and I did, yeah. You can take a hit, girl. <laughs> yeah. Damn. <laughs> I had the most tackles on my team. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I was super active. However, of my sisters, I was the one that fluctuated in weight. And a lot of that was due to um, emotional stuff and, and feeling like I didn't fit in with my family and eating to console myself and just being alone and all these other things. Um, in college, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety and uh, I actually lost weight. So I'll talk about my weight journey and it ties into this. So I lost weight when I got to junior high and that's when I started playing sports. And then toward the end of high school, I was playing less sports. So I kind of fluffed up a little bit more, got to college, lost weight. By the end of college, I had gained a little bit more, but then after college I gained more. And, um, I was in a relationship with my ex fiance. Um, he's now my ex fiance, but it's so funny because I look back and I'm like, wow, this person never would have been anywhere on my radar at this point in my life. But it goes to show the emotional um, situation that I was in at that time. And this is, I was still breaking away from the church. Mm -hmm. So I was getting back in, like back into going back to church after having left when I graduated high school, because I was like, I don't have to go now. So I'm going to college and I'm going to do my own thing, found my way back in. And so I was like doing Bible studies, getting more involved. And that was actually kind of my escape and my strengthening and feeling like I needed to start really taking care of myself because I was in this abusive, manipulative situation and so I was focusing on my relationship with God at the time. Um, and like I said, I had gained more weight at that time. And so then I started to get more active. So I'm tying this back to my um, athleticism before that. So I didn't work out regularly. I would just show up, practice, work out randomly. There was no real um, habit there, you know, for working out on my own. That started to happen during this time when I was engaged and I started loving myself physically more as I was working on my spiritual aspect. And I started to get the confidence and the kind of like the know-how to stand up for myself and, and really get myself along with some help from a few outside people out of that situation. So now I'm going to fast forward back to when I got away from this person and I was working at a hospital in Dallas. And then I started to um, go to this fitness club regularly when I get off of work. Um, so I, I, this was the first time I had taken cycling, yoga or Pilates, and I just loved them. And I, I was, it was natural for me cycling, 
I, I loved that. And my teacher was like, you're, you're really good. You should start teaching. And I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, I never thought about that. Same thing with the yoga instructor. She said that to me too. And she was also the woman who taught bar. So I took two classes with her. Um, so that kind of started to spark my mind. And I knew that when I first went to college, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Um, then I realized how much school that was. I was like, Mm-mm. and then, <laughs> although my undergrad was still the second longest, like, or largest hour requirement. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I thought I was going to go back to school to be like to PA school for my master's. L- long story short, with this high activity that I had like shifted into when I got out of work, I started to find this passion and this love for moving my body. So uh, when there weren't samples coming into the lab at night, I was on women's health, oxygen, muscle and fitness, hers, like researching um, uh, diets and, and different exercise articles and everything. And just, just like diving in, like Bryce, I'm like you, like, I love to get into research and just learn and just like, oh, questions, let me find that out. And then I started to program for myself and I set a goal for myself, like I'm going to lose weight at you know, within this month span, I look up and I had hit surpassed my goal, like three months ahead of time. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm having so much fun doing this. I didn't even realize that I lost this weight, weight, you know, I was, it was just happening. I can teach other people how to do this. So that's how I figured out I'm going to go back to get my master's in exercise science. And so the way that affected me emotionally and spiritually was I felt empowered. I, I, because it happened over time and I was doing research and um, weighing my food. Like, I know this sounds really tedious, but if you're serious about losing weight, you are going to take this into your own hands and, and like relish this power that you have over literally sculpting your own body and shaping your own body into what you want it to be and what is healthy, you know, how you were created to be. So I was weighing my food. I was reading labels, which is so crazy. We're not, they talk about reading the labels, but most people don't ever stop to read the labels. Serving sizes are on there. Like the, the stuff that's in the food is on there, you know? Um, sorry. Um, and it's, it was just like the food was under control. The, the fitness was under control. My mindset was changing. Um, I felt better about myself. I felt stronger. I felt more empowered. Clothes were fitting better. My skin was glowing. My hair was healthy. My eyes were brighter. I, I stood up for myself more. I, the people that I chose to be around just started shifting, you know, so I can totally attest to the fact that when we start to that fitness and emotional and spiritual health go hand in hand, when we start to take care of ourselves on one level, the other things start to fall in place and it changes our entire reality. It changes the people that we associate with, because I don't know if you've noticed like people that look alike typically hang out together, birds of a feather flock together. So you see, um, um, more in shape fit people they're usually going to be hanging out together because they have similar lifestyles they eat um a similar way or they they just carry themselves in a similar energy and that's what's attracted and then same thing with um you know the other end of the spectrum maybe a uh, heavier set people they they eat a certain way they think a certain way they speak a certain way about themselves so the two tie-ins are just it's it's pretty incredible how tied in they are and I feel like that's very dissociated in our society like yes especially with all the shaming well that's one thing too that I I one thing that the powers that be try to do and um, we were kind of speaking about this off camera is you can't stop somebody from moving their body right you can't do Mm -hmm. that what you can do is manipulate the way they think about moving their body And so a lot of people, and one thing I hope to change um, moving forward with exercise is that a lot of, especially women, will look at exercise as something I have to do to look a certain way. It's like a punishment. And I used to be that way because I've been really open about struggling with body morphic disorder. And I saw my body as something that was like a burden that I had to look a certain way in order to receive love, all that kind of stuff. And then going to India and really getting into the energetic body, I started to see it as something totally different. And I've, I'm 39 now. I told, I, I think I've said it on my channel. When I was 27 years old, I threw my scales out and I, I haven't weighed myself since. Um, I just haven't. And I'm not, being overweight is not something I 
struggle with. Um, but I do have the propensity to start like not want to eat sometimes. And so I just don't weigh myself because uh, it, it's better for me. Um, and I have it every time I go to the doctor, I turn around and I tell them not to say my weight out loud. And if I ever got pregnant, I'd probably do the same thing. And, um, and one thing I want to change about people's perception about exercise is that it's, it's your birthright. Somebody asked me, um, um, cause I'm here on vacation. If I, if I'm not, am I enjoying not exercising on vacation? I was like, what do you mean? I haven't, I still get up and I might sleep a little bit later and get up and act, but I still do it. This, I it's, it's my, it's, it's a gift yeah. to be able to move my body. It's a gift to bring my body to life every single day. And one thing I've noticed, and we know that the bad guys do this, is they take a sentiment that is good, but they manipulate the purpose. We see that with a particular organization, I can't say the name, having to do with lives mattering. Well, the sentiment, yes, we all agree with that sentiment, but the organization is nothing to do with that, but is about a political a alliance, right? A political agenda. Um, well, the same thing with the body positivity movement which is something that drives me insane. Of course, you should absolutely love your body. But I've, I've watched so many discussions on YouTube of people who are morbidly obese and they join this circle of people of body positivity. And the minute somebody decides I'm actually going to lose weight, they get shamed for it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like you're succumbing. Well, in yoga, we know that anytime you're overweight or underweight, there's an imbalance. Something's off emotionally. Something's off energetically. It's not just overweight. It's also underweight too. They both qualify as a disorder, right? Both of them on both ends of the, of the, of the spectrum. And so they're pushing this disorder in people and, and creating this morbid sense of, and then also, as you said, using food as, as, as um, an emotional support instead of actually dealing with your issues. And something exercise does, and I'm going to share the screen quickly so our audience can kind of see. Now, most people are aware of the chakra system. And I know, Stephanie, we're going to do a show soon about the chakra system. I've done it on Aquarius Rising Africa as well. And the three from the solar plexus all the way down to Manipur, all the way down to Muladhara are the three chakras that really focus on your body and your groundedness. Then above it, we get into more of the um, ethereal, like psychic love stuff. And so many people in this movement also want to get into like the third aisle, that kind of stuff. But you got to actually, this, the upper bed is never going to be good until this is balanced and down below. Right. But what we I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. And what we also have though, is this a prana, prana and apana. And this is the energy that runs through the body. And Stephanie and I actually filmed yesterday and we talked about the prana, um, with uh, association with the uh, Christ consciousness. So prana is upward, upward moving energy. It's associated with the sun, the solar energy. Apana is downward flowing energy. It's associated with the moon. And so like in, um, in yoga, we have the sun salutations, which in Sanskrit, that's Surya Namaskar. Now the church will tell you, because the church really likes to lie. That's all the church does is lie about everything. That um, you're worshiping the sun. That's not true. That's not, you really can't worship anything outside of your own internal world. What you're doing in Surya Namaskar, the sun salutations, is you're, you're, um, you're rising your pranic energy, right? So Namaskar is a greeting and Surya is prana. So what does that mean? You're warming your body up. When you start to do the sun salutations, you feel your heart rate starts to go up a little bit. You start to sweat. You start when you're, um, you start to feel, actually feel the blood moving and pulsing through the body. You actually feel the energy starting to move and come alive. That pranic energy is telling you you're alive. The aponic energy or the moon, the downward flowing energy, that's like when we exercise our practice yoga, especially, we always twist right first, not left first. We twist right first because your ascending colon is on the right side of your body. And if you twist left first over and over again, you're going to constipate yourself because going to the bathroom is an aponic, a downward flowing energy. And we want to make sure that is also clear and moving as well. Um, having a baby is aponic. 
uh, when we're on our cycle for women, that's an aponic energy. That's why you don't do inversions when you're on your cycle, because that's pranic. And so when you start to understand these different energy flows, and you can kind of see it here, how they move through with the chakra system, through the body, you start to realize that the body is something, here's a good aponic pranic, see upward and downward. The body is something so freaking magical. It's not something to punish. It's not, and it does shift and change. When you're mean to your body, your body is going to show, it's going to swell up. It's going to probably hold on to weight. Yeah. When you actually go, wow, you know, like in, in bar, especially they do the pelvic tucks. When you really start to move and bring your attention to the pelvis and you're starting to unlock these values, these pathways, you can actually feel it. You feel things breaking down and energy moving. If you have, for example, if you're someone that struggles with back pain, nothing's going to fix that back pain until you fix what's causing the back pain. And most of the time, it has to do with your thought process, right? And, and a lot of times that has to do with your hips. So many people don't even know how to, um, how to open up their hips or that their hips are something that needs to be open, but that the hips are like the junk drawer of the human body where we have emotions and we don't know what to do with them or we're uncomfortable. We just shove them in the hips. And then I we want to say something to that Bryce for a second. Cause I actually just recently went through this actually, um, Ava, um, saw me, I, I threw my back out two days ago and I was on a zoom with her late at night and I was having a hard time just even sitting the next day I woke up and I did my workout and it hurt like hell but I felt so much better after and my back is starting to now heal mm -hmm. because I didn't baby it. I kept going, you know, I, I didn't um, do anything that would make it worse, but I continue to do the workout. In addition to that, I have terrible hips and they pop out of the, all the time. The more I've been doing those hip or the pelvic tucks, and moving the hips and getting it all to like all that energy to now circulate in that area where it was very, very weak, the less they're popping out now and the more I can lift my legs higher and the stronger they're getting. So do not allow pain to stop you from doing any kind of no. working out, working on yourself. And yeah. you talk about all, all time, Bryce, but I'm coming from a, a, a place where it's now personal to me. I have a terrible back. I have spinal stenosis and you know what? I'm not, I'm actually, I'm claiming I don't have it anymore because I'm going to heal myself, but I'm not ever going to sit there and allow my pain level to not have me work out again, because I'm realizing that that's actually the worst thing you can do. It's, it's actually my motivation now to help me work out more because the days that I don't work out, I tend to be in pain. Versus the days that I work out, it's a good pain. It's that burning of the breaking down of the muscle tissue so that it can rebuild itself. And what is pain? So let's talk about this for a second. Mm -hmm. This is what they've done. They, mm -hmm. they feel like if anything's uncomfortable, don't do it. Well, here's the thing. Everything that's wrong with your body, you did it to yourself by your thoughts and your attachment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Disease is just dis-ease. It's so, and I, and I had back surgery at 17. Um, I've, I've practiced through a broken sacrum. I've had practiced through a broken wrist, um, all sorts of, I never stopped. You modify when you need to, of course, but you don't stop. And the minute those things go away is when you start to deal with your shit and you start to, um, you start to go through because that's what the, that's what, and we were talking about with this with Cindy, like with ancient practices, like traditional yoga is designed to piss you off uh -huh. on purpose. Um, David Greig, one of my teachers, I've told this story before. He was in conference with Guruji once in, in India and he asked Guruji, he was like, Guruji, because the Ashtanga practice is very painful. It's very physically painful. It's not fun. It's not, it's not joyous. It's, it's very physically uncomfortable. And David said, Guruji, is, is this pain in the practice necessary? And Guruji said, yes, because pain is real. Pain is real. And what happens, you know, one thing that drives me crazy about Western yoga, which is not yoga at all, uh, you know, the teacher puts on music and she creates her own choreograph. And if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Just get in a child's position. That's not yoga, guys. 
If you try to pull that shit off in India, they'll kick you out of the shala. Like that's not fucking yoga. There's a systematic design of postures, first of all, that the teacher did not design because if you design your own practice, you're going to avoid the stuff that's uncomfortable. Like for me, my hamstrings have always been pretty open. My hips have always been pretty open. So anything involving leg behind the head, forward folding, that kind of stuff, no problem for me. I enjoy it. Backbending though, because of my back surgery, because of whatever is going on in here that I've had to work through, that's a totally different story. And so if I were to design my own class, I would just have you put your head, foot behind your head all the time because that's my attachment to something that feels nice. But if I follow the system of Ashtanga Yoga, I'm forced then, as everybody is, to go through every single obstacle. And every single obstacle is an, ex and is an opportunity to shed off bondage, mental bondage. You know, um, it's interesting. In our last video that we just shot, Cindy talked about the nervous system, knowing your nervous system. One thing about backbending that people freak out is we have more nerve endings in the front of our body than the back of our body. This is for a per there's a purpose for that because for most of our human existence, our ancestors, whatever, were in situations where uh, spears would come flying into their tribe, right? And so we were conditioned with the nerve endings for our brain to go, oh, I have to cover my vital organs. So we have ribs over our vital organs, right? Well, nine times out of 10, I mean, it is, yeah, you know, 2022, who knows what can happen until now at this point. But, but most of the time when you're in a yoga shawl and you're doing a back bend, no spear is going to come flying out of the forest. You're safe. And so for me, as a teacher, I tell my students that they go, oh, and it helps them to relax more into that sensation, right? Of, of panic. Right. When I talk about stretch your stomach, don't bend your back. Oh, all of a sudden there's an understanding there of what's actually happening. And so there's a release, you know, that's and do what I said. That's a good cue. Yeah. Oh, back is it's all about stomach opening. Yeah. It's all about opening your stomach and that, that money pour those. We yeah, at the gym, do you see people stretching their stomachs that much? No. Mm -mm. And those are fine. The, the, your app, your abdominal muscles, like the first layer, those are really they're really pliable. Like you touch your stomach, it can move. Yeah. Right? Especially for women, it has to move. Mm -hmm. And for how much people think they just need to get in and do abs and like crunch and crunch and crunch and crunch, but then they don't think about stretching their, their abs. So that's, that's such a good point that you just made. I mean, backbending, it's funny. Second series of Ashtanga yoga. It's a ton of really deep backbends, just one after the other. And then you throw your leg behind your head. Um, and when you're in the Mysore room, because traditional yoga is taught differently, it's taught in a open format where there's the teacher isn't standing at front leading and we don't play music, anything like that. So the teacher works with each student individually and they have a system they have to follow. And whenever I'm in the Mysore room, when a student's finished their, uh, lineup of backbends, they always get off, get off, off their mat and go to the bathroom. And I know exactly what's happened. They're detoxing. You've got toxins that are held in the, those muscles. And when you stretch them open, they're going right into your colon to be then re literally released, like literally. Um, yeah. Awesome. I, I always laugh and, and we're always like, nobody wants to hang out with yoga people because all they do is talk about poops and periods. <laughs> 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 um, you know, but that's, I, we were talking the other night. I mean, not to be TMI, but remember the night we were talking about gassy men, men who are gassy. <laughs> yep. And I, I sure do. I just said, that's not normal. Like we no. now believe that that's just a part of our, body mm -hmm. no, I it's not the doctor I worked with said if you're gassy you're eating correctly no that's supposed to show you how the western medicine was completely manipulated and I said that never sat right with me no that's so comfortable mm -hmm. that's your body telling you something's wrong yeah but it can't yeah. suggest something I'm not gassy I'm not I've dated a few men in the yoga world in the Ashtanga world they weren't either because we were educated in how to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Your dinner table at night, you know, nobody should be eating the same thing at the dinner table. That's a Western thing. You should be eating the food that is appropriate for your body, which is not going to be appropriate for your child or for your husband or for your sibling. If you're forcing your child to eat what you're eating, you're possibly really screwing your kid's health up. 
because they're probably different. And that's, that's the truth of the energy. And when the Western world, we're so just disconnected from that. We see the body and the spirit as being two total, and they are separate things because the body will die and the spirit will go on. But in this existence, the spirit, the soul is what's creating the body. And everybody has a different karmic reaction. Everybody has different karma, different energy to work through. And so if you have gas, you're hurting yourself. Stop it. Go to an Ayurveda clinic, figure this out because that's your body's way of telling you something isn't right. Uh If you're constipated, something isn't right. If you have the opposite problem, usually you have an overabundance of pitta. If you have the opposite problem, something isn't right. Constipation is big with the vata dosha. That's because we're dry, right? So, and that's also big for RH negative people as well. But, um, but yeah, so you have to figure out how, that's your responsibility, but that's the plot twist, right? That's the power move is you have the power and let food be. Thy other, we can be our own doctor. Yeah. yeah. The body has to feel, that's one thing I was thinking about it today. Um, cause I grew up in a medical family. Everybody, my family's the Bryce's my mom's maiden name is Bryce and South Carolina. They are the Bryce is all over the university of South Carolina stadium is the Williams Bryce stadium. They're a huge medical family. All of them for generations have been doctors. And so I was raised in the medical world. I was constantly getting these as a kid and I was sitting there in the car today and I was thinking, how dare us? God gave us the perfect immune system. What makes us think we can do better than that? We've been robbed of everything, everything. And you're right. Like pain. I, I mean, I, my back has been really bad since I was a kid. I was 17 years old when I had spinal surgery and, um, I had to work through, I I mean, I still have flare ups that I have to work through with my lower back, but I know it has not really, it's got nothing to do with my lower back because the, the physical body is a, an expression of what the energetic body is telling it. And so that's something, and I know where it comes from because it's connected to Muladhara, which is the root base chakra, which is your right to be here on this earth that you are enough. And we were texting about this, right? Like, when fear comes up, because these, that's the beautiful thing about exercise as well, is it brings up, it forces, because the energy is moving rapidly through the body, because the body's moving into different shapes, regardless, if you're swimming or doing yoga or running, you're creating a pattern with your, your muscles are alive and it's pumping stuff. So it's like when you're spray, like when you're power washing the driveway and all this mud comes up and starts running down, that's what's happening in your body too. But that mud is bondage that you put on yourself. And so these emotions, sometimes, sometimes you do get flashbacks, but sometimes you just feel an emotion that comes up because it's the emotion that's the trigger. So fear, anxiety, all that stuff starts to come up to the surface because it's being presented to you. Like, like you've boiled it. Now it's being presented to you. Like, ah, here, look at this, look, look at this, look at this for you to then work through it. So that's why exercise becomes so spiritual too, because it forces you And it brings you to a place where the ego, I mean, you know this, Ava, and you know this, Stephanie, when you're doing a really hard exercise and you're exhausted physically and you've got these emotions coming up, you have hit a place of honesty that you can't hit out in the real world when the ego is out. No. I learned that today. (laughs) Yeah. It's honesty. And that's the beautiful thing about injury too. That's um, David Greek says that in Ashtanga Yoga, there are three teachers, the teacher, the practice, the injury, the injury is your teacher because nothing's going to bring you to a level of honesty than when something in your body hurts. Well, like you said, Bryce, you know, I, ha- you know, this, I have a major issue with my wrists and doing anything with putting any kind of weight on my wrists. And instead of thinking, oh, well, maybe I got carpal tunnel or something like I've been told in the past. It's my shoulders are not aligned Mm -hmm. and I'm, and I was not properly um, extending them out. They were in like this instead of being out like that. Um, That's the, uh, oh my God, I know what it's called. Protraction. Yeah. Protraction. Yeah. All that. And so when I went to go do my bar workout today and then um, yesterday, I had to really stop and think and go, are my shoulders aligned? Am I protracting correctly? Um, And I had to really stop and think, you know, what is disaligned or am I aligned? Um, And it's, I'm still getting the hang of it because I'm, I've been so not aligned for a long time. So my body has to now get this memory of just doing it 
but um and i'm sure eventually i'll come to a place where you know like you just go into your he your headstands or your uh handstands and stuff like that um and i know i'll get i'll get to that place one day um but it it's um it hurt like hell i i i dropped a couple f bombs i'm not going to lie but i i continue to work through it the best i could um i do need probably a teacher like right with me and everything, you know, helping me align things. Cause I'm still, you know, a little bit sketchy on getting all the alignment and everything done. Um, but it's teaching me that, no, there's nothing wrong with my wrists. No, it's my shoulders. Well, no, it's, but that's it's here too. Well, that's the thing. Let's, yeah. let's, let's pause on this for a second, because if the body is the expression of the soul and the body is out of alignment, then what does that say about the soul? The soul is a little out of alignment. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because you grew up in a, uh, or you grew up, you worked in a world that told you that your body and your soul were not the same thing, right? And the exactly. you know, issue with your body, it's just your body. You inherit it. You can't really do anything about it. That's it. Yeah. So that, that intentionally fragmented, that's the word that Cindy just used. And I loved it. Fragmented your soul from your body. But now you're rewiring the way yeah. you see this because the body is not separate from the soul. The body was actually created by the soul. That's what it's the Shiva Shakti. It's that's what Shakti yeah. means the creation of the soul. And so that's, if you, if I, I tell people all the time to buy the yoga sutras, read them multiple times. Even if you don't practice yoga, read the yoga sutras multiple times. Sri Swami Satchitananda has got a great commentary where he speaks about this. He speaks about this, right? So when, when we have an up, what the body, the body is the gross body, right? So like this, like just our, our arms, our gross body, everything. If my bicep hurts, like, oh, my bicep hurts or my shoulder hurts. That's the gross body. That's the thing that we can identify first when we first go on, on this journey when we're trying to, when we're going, wait a minute, wait a minute. My body is not separate from my soul in this life because it's the expression of my soul. My soul created this. My thoughts, my energy created this. Wow. Ding, ding, ding. Plot twist. That means I can change it if I want to, right? But it doesn't happen overnight. So when we start to study the body, we start with the gross body because that's what we know. When we skin a knee. When we have a knee pain, we recognize the gross body. When we show wrist, wrist issues are super common in the beginning, mm -hmm. in the beginning, then they go away. Because what happens is when they start, people start to feel that pain and they go, oh, I don't want to do this because my wrist. Well, no, it's because your shoulder is out of alignment. Your core has, you have no core strength. Okay, let's work on that. When we protract, all of a sudden the core starts to wake up. The beautiful thing is God gave you every single muscle you need. You have it. Mm -hmm. You want to do a handstand? You have everything you need, yeah. including the inhale, because the inhale is what lifts you up to a pronic lift, right? You don't, you don't go up into a handstand on an exhale. You're not going to go anywhere. You're going to, yeah. So then we have to work with the breath. The breath then comes into that as well, right? When you lower down into a push up, you're lowering down on an exhale. When you push up, you're inhaling because that's that pronic response. Of that yeah. lifting up, that rising up. I don't teach you that in gym class. No. <laughs> yes, but I told you, like if you were, if I had you in the room, my yoga room, Stephanie, what I would do is I would say, all right, let's let's put you up against the wall. I'm gonna have you put your your bare feet against the wall, and I'm gonna have you squeeze a block in between your thighs. And I'm gonna have you come into a push-up position so that you can see how much your legs are also dumping weight into your shoulders because water runs downhill. And the legs, woo, the legs, mm, those legs, that's some, some, and that's where things get real interesting. Real, because you know that inner thigh, that in bar where they have you, that's why I'm having you do the bar because they squeeze those balls. Oh, yeah. For some women, they'd be like, oh, it gives me skinnier legs. No, this inner thigh, because I'm on my bed so I can do this, this inner thigh right here, this is where we store anger. Well, that's where that came from this <laughs> I did a lot of thigh that. work today and I, oh my God. Okay. So I, I, I already told you I was going to tell this story. The workout I did this morning was all about the glutes and the thighs and, and all of that happy jazz. Right. And I just started to get angry. I mean, I was triggered and I continued through it. I was very proud of myself. I continued through it drop some f-bombs maybe some other words in there a lot of passion words came out and um um <laughs> maybe a couple grunts <laughs> okay but i then 
felt so then I started to do a lot of, like the hip stretching and stuff like that after you know how Marnie does it Marnie Alton um and then I just normally I don't get the flashbacks and everything but I started to get a lot of flashbacks of things that in my past that have angered me mm -hmm. and I allowed myself to sit in it and cry yeah because I had to really I had to face it and release it so let's look at what happens too. And I'm sure Ava, you see this with clients as well. So what the body, what the mind will do, not because the body is just doing what the mind tells it to do. The body is literally like clay that the mind just directs, right? So David used to call it the artful dodger. And I agree with it 100%. So when you don't know, if you don't have the, you know, knowledge is power. So if you don't know that your inner thighs carry potency for held anger, anger, you don't know that. And anger is not fun. It's not fun to be angry. It's not fun to feel that. And you all of a sudden start to ignite your inner thighs, you're exercising, or you're doing a push up, and all of a sudden the inner thighs kick in, which they should. But all of a sudden you feel that anger. What does your mind then do? It goes, oh shit, drops the legs because intuitively it knows that's where that's coming from, and then dumps the weight into the shoulders. And then what do you have? Wow. You have wrist issues, you have shoulder issues. So then we say, oh, I have wrist issue, shoulder issue. Okay, well, what's my body telling me? My shoulder's telling me that I just took all this weight and dumped it into it. What the fuck, man? Like, you just gave me all this weight. But then the, the mind's going, but the thighs have anger. I don't want to deal with it. But then the this, this psychological, spiritual aspect says, no, no, no. We need to deal with it. It's there. We have to. We have I to dealt with it. it. And it'll keep coming back up. I oh, dealt with it. <laughs> that's what I'm I'm it. <laughs> so this wrist issue that you have is beautiful. It's gold. Okay. Golden wrist, folks. Golden now wrist. Have, like, like a state of great, now we have something. Now we have something to work on. Right? And think about that opportunity that if, if you're, you walked away because your wrist hurt, that karma is not going anywhere. That anger is not going anywhere. You're just going to have to deal with the next life. And it's going to stay there until you actually deal with it. But when we actually understand that when the body hurts, it's not a bad thing. It's the body just telling. It's just communicating with you. It's saying, hey, something's imbalanced. Show me. Sh t t talk to me. Show me. All right. Now, if you get a teacher or an instructor that knows these things, they can work you through it. I would have you at the wall squeezing a block while you did push-ups and telling your feet not to leave the wall as you come up and down to make sure those legs stay engaged. The da most dangerous thing you can do with stretching especially is to passively stretch. Because that's when injury happens. When we stretch, when it went in um, Ashtanga yoga, well, Ashtanga yoga, there's a lot of cardio in between the stretching. But like when we do seated series, for example, if my students' feet are not flexed, I will come and kick their leg. Because when your feet aren't flexed and they're relaxed, guess what happens to your knee? It relaxes. The joint relaxes. The muscles deflate. What happens when the nut muscles deflate? Well, the joint could get injured, first of all. But second of all, energetically, you're not moving energy in your body. When the muscles are engaged, that's the energy moving through the body. If they're not engaged, it's just sitting there. So we're moving that energy. And I will say to my students in like a leg class, because I only teach a leg class once with at Cindy, the rest is just my sore, like tap into that. Feel that sensation. Instead of being in the practice and thinking about the laundry you have to do or wondering like if you're going to see your boyfriend like actually go into your body and feel that sensation of the energy moving beyond all the emotions that are coming up that's your body showing you that you are alive how many people are alive but they forget they're alive we're too distracted we are, watching to be alive. We are kind of walking in a world full of zombies right now. yeah yeah <laughs> now more than ever probably yeah yeah 100 percent so yeah. um, could I share a little bit, just personal um, experience about what you're talking about, Bryce? Yeah, of course. So I had a friend back in Dallas who taught um, yoga and it was the, the hot yoga, you know, and I, like I mentioned, it was, it came pretty naturally to me. So I was more advanced for the, you know, this Western type of yoga. I feel so funny talking about it now that I have you as my friend and you're like, that ain't real girl. I'm like, I feel like I'm like, well, I did some of it. <laughs> but it's like, I'll teach you when we're, 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 we're all together. I'll teach you. I cannot wait for that. Let me tell you, like, seriously, I love, I've, I've talked to y'all about this before. I'm like, I'm the type of person who's like, let me know my lessons. Like, I'm trying to hurry up and learn this. Like, let's get in the, I want to go deep and dig in the mud. Get that out the way. 
You'd be a great Ashwanga student then. <laughs> I That's why I'm so excited. And like whenever uh, Cindy came on your show and talking about shadow work and like how she speaks about it, I'm like, yes, girl. Like that's like so me. But uh, anyway, so when I would start, I would carry crystals with me to class. And sometimes I'd like put them in my bra because they would just stay with me when I'm moving or I'd like set them at the edge of my mat. But when we would start out the practice, I would... Um, speak to spirit and be like, you know, teach me or show me what I need to know, essentially, you know, whatever messages you have for me, because I'm a very, I'm very in tune with my body. And I, I'm the type of person who is there to connect with myself when I'm moving. I use that, like for me, working out, like meditation, you know, stretching or anything. I'm anytime I'm moving my body, I'm learning and I, I, you know, thoughts and feelings come up and I love that connectedness anyway so um anytime i don't know what the actual sanskrit word is but cow pose when your legs are like essentially when your knees are stacked on each other and they're gomugasana what is it gomugasana gomugasana mm-hmm. okay yeah so whenever i would get in that for a while i would just start like the i'd be like <gasps> you know like just start to get choked up and um Anytime I have to stretch this outer portion, like the outer glutes and, and that part, and just getting real deep into my, my, um, my quads or my hip uh, musculature. And I also, so with dance and cheerleading, I'm fairly flexible in my hips. However, like I can do my splits both ways, but my straddle splits, I've had a hard time getting into this. And so it makes so much sense that you're talking about anger's held in that that portion of our body, because I held a lot of anger toward myself for so long, toward my family, toward others, you know, just through all the the trauma and the stuff that I went through growing up. Uh, So I, I can get like, I've gotten, it's like I get to this certain point And I can't get past that to the ground, but I'd be really interested to see how close I can get now because I know I've done a lot of work over this past year, but I haven't like, I haven't like been doing yoga in that time since I moved up here and stuff. So it'd be interesting to see that. So a lot of women also struggle with, um, so that's the saddle split is called Upavishta Konasana. Mm -hmm. And there's another one where you bring your feet together called Bado Konasana. Um, but Upavishta Konasana, more than Bada Konasana, women who have uh, experienced RAPE or any type, and not necessarily the full extreme of, of that, but any type of like SA or SM. Sorry, guys, we have to be very careful about what we say. I think you guys know what we're talking about. Yeah. have a really hard time opening up that area as well, especially in Upavishta Konasana, because your legs are literally spread apart, right? That's very vulnerable. And, um, one thing again, you want to do is make sure your feet are flexed so that the the muscles are actively, then when you start to fold forward, you're opening up that area. Now this might get a little bit TMI, but we have, um, I've, I've spoken about this with the bundas as well. Cause in Ashtanga yoga, we focus on the bundas more than the chakra system. The bundas system is the locks in your body. So you have mola bunda, which is in your perineum, which is right in your crotch basically. Um, and that connects to your big toe. So that also connects to your inner thigh. So in India, they will stick their hand and check your mola bunda. I can't do that. And I say in India, it's not weird. It just, it is not weird in India. It just is what it is, not weird. Um, but in America, I can't do that, nor do I want to do that to my students. So I look at their big toes a lot. And when they're on the mat and their big toe is not pressing into the mat, I know that their mola bunda is not locked. Mm. And so for women, that's like a Kegel. So what happens too, when we do postures like Upa Vishto Konasana, where the legs are spread apart and we're folding forward is we have to keep that leg flex. So the big toe is actively opening up the inner thigh, but we're also holding that perineum in. So we're keeping the energy inside the body. If you fart in yoga class, your bunda is not, is not locked. Basically. That's another sign that your bunda is not locked. Uh, women, when you're on your cycle, you're, you don't have mala bunda. It's like a wet paper towel. I know that sounds gross, but it becomes very loose because your body's detoxing, right? So it can't lock. It's got to get this, the, the lining out of your uterus. Um, and so there's all these like cues with the body. And I used to be that way with Upavishta Konasana where I had a really hard time folding, but there was some stuff regarding that that I had not dealt with. And the more I dealt with it now, it was super easy to get my chest to the floor because I dealt with it. And also my body went, okay, because my mind went, okay, 
And sometimes with trauma too, what I've noticed, uh, it's just accepting that it happened. Because sometimes we don't want to, we know it happened, but we don't want to accept that it happened. And so we just sit there and say, yeah, that fucking happened. And I'm still here. All of a sudden the body goes, okay. Right? That's so true. That's so yeah. true. A perception of your trauma. Yeah, perception. Because because that is, that's all it is. Is uh, Shanti talks about this all the time and she's so right because that is the yoga philosophy. Everything that happened to you is a project- projection of your own issues everything mm-hmm. like when, when you go into um because i have we just talked about this cindy i had the propensity for many years going into uh, relationships with narcissists with men who were not very nice um to it culminated with me one night almost losing my life because i i would think that i had dealt with it because i would meet a new guy and maybe he was a little different or looked different but no the issue was still there i hadn't changed anything i just changed the outfit the issue was in mm-hmm. right and so when I finally had to deal with it, everything changed because I, I had to deal with it. It wasn't about punishing them. It was about healing myself. You had asked me and we were in a group text with this and I wanted to bring this up. I went to the same cycle. I dated probably five or six narcissistic men back to back to back. And your question was, why did you allow the abuse? And my response was, I was looking for love from an outside source rather than me, the inside source. Yeah. And that comes even deeper. There's even deeper roots to that, which we spoke about, which is knowing, having a sense of self. Yeah. And And they teach us in this Western world to lose your sense of self, especially church background. You must lose yourself to find yourself. You must lose yourself and find Jesus Christ. And then you find yourself. It doesn't work that way. Because the thing is, God lives within each and every one of us. Yeah. And who do you spend the most time with in your lifetime is yourself. Be your yeah. best friend. Love yourself. And it's, it's, it, it is hard to do. It is. And it requires a lot of work, a lot of inner work, a lot of uncomfortable work. But boy, when you start to do it, you start to see the benefits you reap what you sow yeah and if you're working doing so much inner work you're gonna start to look in the mirror and no matter what you you know whether you don't like your freckles or for me it's my hair I have a big uh insecurity about my hair because I lost so much of it like years ago so it's something I have to work through well why don't I love my hair it's not just that it's thin it's there's more to it there's deep there's, there's something else rooted in that. So when you start to do this inner work, you can love yourself regardless of what you've been through and how you look. And, um, but when you do, like you said, Ava, when you start doing the physical work, you know, you start, um, looking better and feeling better. That also comes with, um, also a lot of more self-confidence too. So, I mean, it all comes hand, hand in hand. I mean, you shouldn't just work out just to lose weight. And that's no. it. That, it doesn't work that way. I don't even want people, the weight will come off as it needs yeah. to, as you start. Cause if you lose weight, if you go on like some crash fad thing and you, you're losing weight just to look good in a dress for one day, you're not working on, you're not dealing with yourself. If you deal with yourself, the weight's going to come off and stay off because the weight is just a symptom of something imbalanced. Mm-hmm. And with like the hair situation, like I would encourage you to research what that means spiritually, where, where that, what, what, what that connects to within these energy cycles here where there's imbalance because your body's telling you something. It's like when people have knee issues, okay? Knee issues are connected to kidneys. Kidneys are connected to fear, specifically fear of the future. So when somebody tells me they have a knee issue, I'm like, all right, well, what are you afraid about in the future? What well, that you- explains. <laughs> I'm learning so much here, guys. <laughs> I'm learning so much. I was having knee issues too. My biggest issue was fear of death. Funny part is I'm no longer afraid of death. My knees hardly ever hurt me. Yeah. So this is what, this is what the West, they want us to think that anytime there's a pain, it's something else. So beyond yourself, it's something you've inherited. Yeah. You kind of, you, cause you inherit energy from, yeah. from your parents. And so if your dad had a fear of the future and that sperm was at that vibration and it went into the egg that made you, you're going to carry that too, but it's not your it's dad's interesting. It's not your dad's responsibility to deal with that. Mm-hmm. It's yours, uh-huh. your responsibility to deal with that. 
that's why you know uh, guruji used to say that when you practice yoga and you deal with this you vibrationally change change seven generations beneath you yeah yeah that's so that's so powerful so powerful um i wanted to add on to what stephanie was saying about working on yourself and learning to love yourself and spending time with yourself when we do that more and we learn and we we approach everything as the observer in our lives and and the emotions that come up and how we responded in certain situations it makes it so much easier to navigate social situations because because you understand yourself it's easier to understand others and if we are all one then you're interacting with yourself healthier and it's easier to approach outside relationships healthier too and that's one thing that I'm really valuable that I've learned by spending so much time with myself and being forced to work on my crap you know you, you don't become like we were talking about this, um, you know, when we have like certain behavior patterns that aren't healthy, right? And let's take something that and you know, Stephanie, we were talking about this. I don't know if we were on a show or off the air. You know, let's talk about something women kind of do a lot uh, is they become needy with men. We all have that girlfriend that like will obsessively text her boyfriend, you know, and instead of telling her just don't do that. As a yoga teacher, I would ask her, why are you doing that? Well, I think he's cheating. Maybe, but nine times out of 10, he probably isn't. Did you do this with your other boyfriends too? Yes. Okay. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And then it, you whittle, you start whittling it back. And, um, and most of the time people come, it comes down to not feeling like they're enough. We don't feel yeah. like enough. You don't have a sense of self. And I'm not talking about the sense of self as in knowing what your favorite color is or your favorite food is. That's all part of just your personality, which is just a, just one layer of who you are. Your sense of self is just that wholeness within you that you can sit with and be alone with. Um, we were talking off air, somebody in the truther community that I think has a huge sense of self and you can tell by his behavior is David Zublik on the dark outpost. He's so grounded. And I've been on his show now for over two years, once a week. He is so consistent. He is, he never, you know, people who have mood swings, you know, they, 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 they're emotional into the sense where they can't, I mean, I'm emotional, but they can't handle their emotions. They project emotions onto other people. That's somebody that's not comfortable with, or doesn't know their sense of self. And those emotions that are out of hand are showing them that. No one can fix that. No medicine can fix that. No drug can fix that. They have to fix it by actually sitting with themselves, being alone, getting involved in a discipline. That's what exercise is too. It's, it's, it's you know, where do we get the word disciple from? Hey. Discipline. You become a disciple to source when you use your body in the way it was supposed to be used, which is your GPS to your soul. And yeah, the church, they're the biggest, those motherfuckers lie about everything, right? Like they literally like, they're yep. dirtier in the deep state than the, the church. Like it is the yep. dirtiest of, I mean, the cap, Capitol Hill is pristine compared to the church. It is dirty. They've lied to you about everything. So let's look at what they've done. What did Yahshua teach? What did Magdalene teach? They taught you that you were enough. That you, yep. they were Gnostic, they were Gnosis, the inner Gnosis, not the EDO, not the outer knowledge, the inner knowing. That you, you have that spark of life. You, you have the pathway to God. What did the church do? They manipulate those teachings. They said, well, you have Control. to have Jesus. You, you're not enough. You have to have this, this dude, mm -hmm. this guy. Are you sure you believe? Are you sure? So you lose that sense of self. We just celebrated Easter, which is not, I mean, Yahshua wasn't crucified. Why would, why would this, why would source ask for a human sacrifice? That's what Lucifer does. Yep. No human being can repay your karma for you. No human being can go for your, through you your, you have to keep going through the cycle until you learn. And you brought up a good point um, on our last video with Cindy. And you said, God doesn't care how long it takes. Our, our souls are eternal. Uh, we, we might care though, because let's, let's, you know, I don't think we want to continue these really rough cycles. And to me, let's just do this. Let's get this over and done with. I'd rather handle this now 
in this pre- in this life, I'm, I almost said previous life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in this present life. Um, I want to do this now. <laughs> and so I think you got all three of us are at the same level on that. Um, but yeah, God doesn't care because God knows we just will have to continue to, to learn and learn and learn until, until we actually like get it. Yeah. And what you said sin means miss the mark. Mm-hmm. You just have to continue to keep living out these lifetimes until you learn the lesson. Might as well get it over with and done now and face your shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, sin does not. Yes. Yeah, sin is not what the church tells you it is. Sin just means to miss the mark, to not know who you are. So every time you, if you're sitting, and you don't know who you don't have a sense of self, then you're in sin. You're missing the mark. Now let's think about the actions that the church has said is sinful. Let's look at having affairs. Now I believe 100% in monogamy. That is my choice. I, you know, if you are polyamorous, then good for you, boo. That's just not something I can handle it for me. That's too much. And I also know that karmically, when you have an intimate relationship with someone, you are also sharing that energy with that person. And so you have to take that into consideration as well. If you're doing it with multiple people, holy shit, that's a shit show. You know, um, talk about more karma you're building with that. Okay. But let's talk about affairs. You know, that's listed as a sin, right? To have an affair. But if we look at some affairs now, if, if my husband was cheating on me, I would leave him for sure. And it would be hard and it would be trauma and I'd have to work through it. But how many people do you know have had affairs and then they've had children in those new relationships? Uh So are those children's lives not valuable? And do we not something to learn in every single situation? And um, do we understand that karmically those people made that agreement to go through that, to learn from each other? Um, That's, uh, I mean, that's what betrayal is a huge one. That's what affairs are. They're betrayal. And as Shanti said it best, well, what's the opposite of betrayal? It's truth. So when someone betrays you, you're there to now learn truth. Yeah. So, and, and, and so there's always, if we, if we, if we use the obstacles, these hard things that come at us in our life, look at what all we've gone through in the past couple of years. I'm sure everybody watching right now, even though it sucked, think about 2019. Do you want to go back to that person in 2019? God, no. Hell no. No, I'm good. I'm going to leave that over in 2019. <laughs> 2019, I was already awake. So I'm, for me, it'd be like 2014. I would never want to go because I woke up pretty soon after, thanks Jordan Maxwell, <laughs> on his video on the cult of Saturn. That's when first like, <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> something right here. Um, so, so, right. So you, So everything you've gone through, it's led you to where you are now and you agreed to it because that's Dharma. Mm-hmm. That's the whole purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, it's, uh, Cindy actually talks about this in her courses. I sat in one of her courses once I was teaching on a, I was there to teach in a portion on Ashtanga and I sat in the tail end of her teaching and I was like, yeah, she's right. And you know, the Bhagavad Gita, it's one of my, it was the most life-changing book I ever read. And it's this dude, Arjuna, he's literally standing on the battlefield and he's facing off to fight over this land. He's looking across the battlefield to his friends, his teachers, people he's loved in his life. And he's got to go to war with them. And he don't want to do it. Who does? And so he's having like a meltdown. And he's having this like come to Jesus moment. And so Krishna, who is the avatar, who, which is Christ. That's the, the uh, avatar of Christ was, was the deity in this, in this epic. And so Krishna comes down and has a little conversation with Arjuna. Now, most people think all oh, spirituality our, our Christian would have been like, okay, Arjuna, it's okay. Just come back here with me. No, Christian was like, you're a fucking warrior. Cowboy up. Mm-hmm. Get your arrow ready. You got to go kill people. This is your dharma. You agree to this. You can't back out. This is it. I kind of went through that. I mean, I woke up in 2021. Well, I started to wake up in 2020. I mean, I guess I've been awake to like a bunch of different things my whole life. Mm -hmm. I'm sure as both of you have certain things, but I'm talking like the real like deep rooted, deep state stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the uh, little people go, you know, being brought to all places of the world, you know, where I'm going with that. Um, Like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I remember 2021 hit. And I hadn't seen my family in almost a year at this point. No fight, no nothing. And it was like uh, God's voice, Yahshua's voice, 
you need to part ways with them. And I literally had a hissy fit in my head, of course. I cried. I carried on, you know, in my in my mind. Um, because I'm a, I'm a family girl. I, I like the, the, the family unit, and that's important to me. But instead of thinking, well, maybe this isn't good for my highest good. And I had to really grieve that. And I, I know why now I'm not going to go in. You guys know, know why, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say it on camera. But um, I had to really grieve and I know it's not like going to battle like that particular story, but in a sense, it's like he had to face his teachers and his friends and his family. Right. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it was like, I had to kind of go against my family in terms of their views, their programming on me, everything that they taught me, the way that they view me. There are thoughts about me, all these different things that were all, all these arrows that were always flung at me. And I had to say, nope, not doing it anymore. And again, that goes with self-love. And if that, if that means you cut off people in your family because they are not, because they're, they're toxic, then that's what you have to do. But there was a lesson I had to learn. There was a lot of grieving. There was a lot of pent-up emotions that had to be brought up. There was a lot of purging. I've talked to you ladies about this several times, but I know it's not the same kind of story or anything, but it's like, um, I kind of had to buck up and grow. I'm a girl, but I had to kind of grow a pair in a sense because it was not easy for me. Well, and I'll do you one better with the Arjuna story. Let's go a little deeper with this. Okay. So this is what we talk about in yoga. Every time you get on your yoga mat, that's your battlefield. Where are you having to battle yourself? Where are things within you that you're battling? where there's friction that you're having to face. Oh, there's a whole bunch of things. That's when that real, that's when the real, and that's when the artful dodger sets in. Oh yeah. That's the real battlefield. Cause everything and, inside of us is a projection of our inner world too. Yeah. Well, it's funny you bring that up too, Bryce, because it was like the removal of all of that then became working on me. Why? Why am I this way? Why am I acting this way? Why do I have these bad habits? What do I need to learn? What do I need to work on? Why do I need to work on? And so it's been this, there, it's been a lot of dips and mountains and valleys and mountains and, and, and this kind of roller coaster thing. But now I'm seeing the trajectory of it all and I'm understanding now. I'm still not 100% understanding. And that's, that's going to be a lifelong journey, of course, Absolutely. for all of us. But yeah. It's part of what you said. Spirituality is it's lifelong. And so it's like, I had to have that removed in order to do the self work. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah. there's a lot of noise around me. Otherwise it was, yeah. why can't you do this? Why can't you say that this way? And there was a, uh, it was like, so it was even worse than church almost in a way. It was like, everybody was trying to shape me and mold me into what they wanted and projecting their own shit onto me. And no, I, I need to that. focus on me. You can't control somebody else's projections. No. Well, your own. And yeah. that's why I say like, this is the whole, like where your body's not aligned was well, your soul not aligned. So if there's chaos in your life, <coughs> then that tells me there's chaos inside of you. Yes. Because yeah. like attracts like we attract what we are when there's peace inside of you. I have a really peaceful life for the most part, besides the whole, you know, coven thing. But as far as like my actual life, I, I have a very peaceful existence. I sit at my desk and record all day, but you know, I, I have a very, I, everybody in my life is very peaceful, kind. It hasn't always been that way, mm -hmm. but because I worked on myself, everything shifted. Yeah. And, and it's funny because even like I have people now who they're used to me being all me, you know, like anxiety ridden. And now they're like, you're creepy because you're just so calm. <laughs> I'm like, because I have a sense of self now. Yeah. Because I have a sense of loving myself and I have boundaries mm -hmm. and I know what's good for me and what's not. I'm taking better care of myself. I'm, I'm having uh, more self-confidence where I never had that before. I've done a total 180 and they're like, girl, what the hell happened to you? Like, mm -hmm. we don't know you. <laughs> And you but, will trigger people that are not within their. Oh school. my God. Yeah. Trigger people. The moment people you put up boundaries, they like scatter like roaches. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. And, but you start to find though, it goes into too, like 
who is truly there for you? I, I, you're truly there for yourself. You have to be. But it also shows you kind of where in your life, what kind of company you're attracting. It goes back into what you said, Ava. You know, uh, you, you attract what you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it goes in hand in hand where people who were attracted to me because of my insecurities and my flaws and the way I was acting, they had to scatter because God forbid they, they want to go work and they can't work on themselves. They're, they're not at that level yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm above them. It's just that now there is this, like, it's like, um, there was no more magnet anymore. It was like the repelling, mm -hmm. you, you repel people that cannot line up with that frequency. Yeah. There's an energetic. Divide. Yeah. They either vibrate with up with you or they vibrate away from you. Yeah. And so you're going to start to figure out people who are truly in your life because they truly love you and respect you and care about you versus people that just misery loves company. It's so true. Well, and sometimes people are karmically there to teach you a lesson too. That's, That's true. true. Yeah. And those, those are horrible people to have around, but we all agree. Yeah. To, and um, mm -hmm. when you recognize a person as being a karmic, then you go, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. And it. Then, yep. It and makes so much sense. Come into a close. You say, thank you. We well, you yeah. tell them thank you, but thank you spirit for that polarity. See you never. <laughs> I, I got it. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. If, if there's someone, people be like, what's a karmic. If there's someone in your life that's causing you intense stress, that's a karmic. Mm -hmm. That's a karmic. And so they're there to cheat you. Yeah. As awful as they are, it's a karmic lesson for you. They're not they're going to be there forever. They're only going to be there until you learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. and, and there have been times when you've been a karmic in somebody else's life too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all that's have that role. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell people, I'm like, in my videos, I'm like, it's okay to ask for help. We have angels. We have ancestors. We have cre creator, God there. Like we have to, because those good and high beings are not going to overstep the laws of free will. Mm -hmm. We have to use our voice and speak to the universe and put that vibration mm -hmm. out there that we want the help to identify those lessons, you know, quickly. And I, I, I say it, I'm like, ask for it, you know, quickly and with love. So you don't get your ass kicked because I'm about to say, sometimes if you ask for, if you say, I want to be spiritually healed, yeah, yeah. We're going to go Because no one is that. No one is that. Well, speaking of have mercy, I know. I know. Just help me get through. Just help me get through this. Um, yeah. This, we were talking about this beforehand for people to start to understand their uh, their power. And I know people do this in like Reiki. Uh, and I have taken, I've been more open. About, I have taken level one, level two Reiki. I did it for chits and giggles a long time ago. I knew that was never going to be my modality of healing. I just wanted to learn. And so I, I do, I have taken those courses, but I don't do Reiki. I, I yoga is my thing, but I, I want it because I respect it it's so much. But you see this Ace of Cups, <laughs> of course, it's the Ace of Cups card. She's got a bowl okay, there. Yeah. She's got a bowl with the overflowing of the baby batter, we'll just say. But um, anyway, sure, Lord. you see how she's holding her hands. And we were talking about this. And when you do this exercise, you don't just like hold. It's like, like I talk about flexing your feet. You need your, your body to be activated. Now in Ashtanga yoga, we don't like the, the fingers to be separated. Like when people do like the jazz hands in yoga where they do like <laughs> your fingers, darlings, jazz hands in Ashtanga, we keep our hands completely because that's also where energy releases too is through. So we want to keep that locked. So I would do it this way because that's how curving the split. Now you keep your everything connected, everything. And you will, if you sit there by yourself for a few minutes and you focus on the energy between the palms of your hand, you will start to feel the energy flowing through your hands. This is energy that's also flowing through your body. It's also flowing through the bottoms of your feet. Yeah. So that's something people can play with it. They're just now figuring out that their body is really special and magical. And it feels like there's something in between the palms and it's so funky feeling. I love it. So when I go to adjust somebody, because adjustments in Ashtanga yoga, we call them manhandling or cranking, you know, like in Western yoga, cranking, <laughs> oh, cranking. Yeah. Um, you know, when in, uh, in Western yoga, like they give like, I just been so long time. So I will, I still asked me today about taking a yoga class. I, I will not go to a yoga class unless I have <laughs> studied in yoga in India and has studied longer than me. So I won't do it. It's a waste of time. Otherwise, yeah. for me. I'll just get pissed off. 
Are you not allowed to or something? Like I can that? take other, I can't teach. If I was involved oh, in oh. vinyasa flow, I would, or it, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> if I was involved in vinyasa flow classes or in the yoga alliance, like teacher trainings, I would lose my authorization mm. they that very seriously because teacher trainings are not okay in, in India. But um, I wouldn't go because I would probably just make me mad because the yoga alliance doesn't teach properly. They really screwed up the, the teaching. Like so, um, but when I go to adjust somebody or crank somebody, even though they're not pleasant, like if you do take that, sometimes they like rub your back, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen in traditional yoga. They don't, <laughs> they don't read poetry to you. There's no in your play. They're usually yelling at you and like pulling, I mean, sweat's flying. I've been farted on. I've been all sorts of stuff all over me. It's I've had my boob grab more in a mice room than, uh, <laughs> than any other, than in the, than in the bedroom. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> fine whatever students you know they, they grab because they're like and you're like it's it's fine it's soft it's fine, <laughs> um, you know i have teachers male teachers i've always had a male teacher and they i prefer having a male teacher and i've been grabbed unintentionally and it's no big deal whatever but um but when i go to adjust i always think about my hands because even though i'm going to be forcefully moving somebody's body and th that goes back to um i uh, the raw thing if you've ever done raw thing um, and the woman who created the Rolfing system, she figured out that no matter how much work you do yourself, there are certain patterns that you will not be able to break. You'll have to have an external force help you. And that's where the adjustments come. Usually it comes in twisting, getting the body to open in a twist. Um, and so when I go, I, I use my whole, we climb on top of people. I stand on people. Uh, Cindy loves it. There's a Bhattaquanasana adjustment where I lay on her back and lift my legs up. And, and Cindy, we just filmed with, I always do that for her because she loves that adjustment. It's a true yoga student where you're like, give it to me. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's intense. And so I, but I think about that when I'm um, adjusting students that I have to use my energy. I listen to their inhale. I listen to their exhale. I move the body on an exhale. If I'm lifting them into like a handstand or if I'm helping them with the transition, I have to wait for their inhale and I have to inhale with them to use the energy appropriate to lift them. Um, so it, it, there's a lot that goes into it, but you see that when you start to work with the hands that there's so much energy there. And if you are a teacher or a Reiki healer with great power comes great responsibility days when I'm not feeling that great, when my energy feels off, I won't do as many happy adjustments because I know my energy is not. That's why in most traditional yogas, you get up at two o'clock in the morning and you do your day of practice before you go teach at 4am. Because you are not supposed to be in that mice room teaching unless you've already done your practice because you've already worked through your energy. That's how serious it is. It's how serious they take it. So um, anyway, all right, ladies, do we want to pull like one or two cards to see like what spirit wants to tell us about discovering our bodies moving forward? Yeah. Do you want tarot or oracle? You choose. Whatever you think. Whatever you feel. Whatever I Tarot. I only have Tara with me. I'm, I was telling Stephanie, Oracle cards, they are, um, they're harder to read sometimes, you know? Depends on the deck. Yeah, it depends. Uh, do you want me to, to read Oracle then, since y'all are both doing tarot? I just pulled two cards, and I think that that sums enough. You guys do it. Whatever you, whatever you feel like you should do. Okay. <laughs> but I just, two cards flew out, and I felt this is perfect. The Eight of Wands to the Moon. So quickly moving into finding out secrets about yourself. That's how I read that. Yeah. Hmm. Holy crap. These cards are so accurate. Okay. So what I'm getting here is, um, so first off, I have the four of pentacles and the four of pentacles is like, you're hanging on to something with your life. Let go. Let go of what this mind, you know, has been fed all of the programming, such as the whole pain concept, such as um, the Western ways, you know, uh, everything that we've been taught. Um, don't cling to that. You know, or this could be um, also like, um, how do I put it? I, I think this is more like less saying let, let go of the programming. Okay. Um, like for me, I have to let go of all of the stuff I learned about the human body in the Western medicine world that I had to let go of that because that does not serve any purpose any longer. Um, 
this is a spiritual and a karmic thing going through these things. We were just talking about that. So a lot of karmic lessons will be coming up and that's part of the spirituality in it. So exercising is not just getting your body to look good. Like we said, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing, but it's a lot of, uh, a dropping cards, <laughs> a lot of letting go of the old karmic lessons that we have to let go of and which is going to move you up spiritually. And it's going to be freaking hard to do. This, this is a hard thing to do, but, um, hold on. I need to pull one more card. Allow it. Yeah. It's part of why you chose to be a human. So two of wands normally means to block. I'm actually getting this opposite. You will unblock yourself. Look at that dragon. Wait. Yeah. He that's a dragon. I love that. <laughs> Bring on the dragon, the red dragon. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have the page of pentacles. This is actually, I feel like saying physically know your body, like the energy. Get to know the nervous system, get to know the uh, chakras, those, uh, the, the way the energy flows. You're going to actually start to find that you are knowing yourself even more on a higher level. And, and again, it's like unblocking yourself from, um, you know, uh, maybe unlock, unlock those channels, like what, like with the hips or, yeah, and um, the dragon can also be like the serpent and the serpent is the, yeah, the kundalini awakening. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly. Hard. That's coming through exercise, guys. Just that was like, that was crazy accurate right there. That's yeah. like awesome. That comes up Shashumna, which is the, the nadi, the vayu in the spine that um, is also along the path of the chakra system and the bundas. That's a whole other video we can get into one day. If want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I pulled from the Cosmic Dancer Oracle and then I felt like there was a message in message in the gateway of light oracle as well so i pulled one from that uh the first one i got was play and this has a very like three of cups feel to me this is is like finding we uh i don't remember who i was talking to but exercise is not a one size fits all thing people and it just because somebody put up this like super great workout or whatever it might not be for you you might hate running you might hate uh cycling you might hate whatever find what makes you smile and what makes you happy like i cannot even express enough how excited i felt to get off work and go work out when at this time when i was losing weight and the weight felt uh, like it's a privilege yeah the goal was surpassed way ahead of time because my heart was in it because i was enjoying what i was doing so play Find what your body likes to do. Find what makes you happy, where you're moving, where you're getting your heart rate up and you're sweating. So, you know, you're moving this energy out and you're um, transforming and um, transferring whatever's stuck and, and uh, alchemizing that for your health, for your benefit and be authentic with yourself. Be authentic. So whatever comes up, acknowledge it with love with non-judgment too that's very very important because like like bryce was saying um with uh salt or or ripe or any any type of crazy traumatic situation yes it happened in your life and yes it might have been it's essentially something that you agreed to but when those things come up, look at them with a loving eye and a non-judgmental eye and, and, and acknowledge that that happened and be in integrity with yourself and your emotions. Because when you show up and you're authentic with yourself, you can be more authentic with others the way you uh, show up in life. Um, I also have higher heart activation, dropping shields, divine love. Your heart is healed. So this again goes into when we're moving and we're shaking those things around and, and dealing with that root, uh, that root chakra, we're cracking open like that one card that you have in the deck, Stephanie, I think it's starseed Oracle, maybe, I don't know, but it's cracked open and it's like, you're, breaking open that tough shell or that tough exterior and get and letting the light shine through and the beauty shine through and letting that energy rise up and and you and you can start heart healing from moving your body 
because as, as Bryce was speaking about, like a lot of shame and anger and pain and trauma is just tucked away in these folds and in these, um, um, it he like myofascial adhesions in our in our bodies and in our fascia and everything. And when we start to break that apart, we can then start to really heal because that energy is free to flow. So yes, I think these were very clean. Yeah, that came through when I was doing a healing session with Shanti once, and that came through when I was under. I said, um, she told me afterwards. I said, I realized the more and then, you know, the more my heart breaks, the more the light comes in. Yeah. I love that. And, and she actually told me I'd said that afterwards. And I was like, that's probably all the years of Ashtanga yoga then, because yeah, the more I realize the more trauma I've been through and the more I deal with it myself, the more compassion I have, the more empathy I have, the better teacher I am, the more authentic I am. And that, that sense of authentic, that, that brings back to that sense of honesty too. When you allow yourself to like, when you allow for things to get hard and uncomfortable, it brings you to an authentic place of honesty. And that's when magic happens. Yeah. So. All right, guys. Um, let us know in the comments below if you want us to do a round two. And I was telling Ava, now Ava's in like a transitional period in her life, but I was, you know, because Ava is a trainer. And so I was trying to talk her into actually putting some workout videos on her YouTube. I love that idea. What and, and when I get a little bit more situated, or like I really want to do that sooner than that. So I'm working that out, you all. <laughs> yeah. So y'all let her know if you want her. And I was actually thinking, no, I can't put Ashtanga yoga up because I have to teach you in person because of the way it's set up. But I was thinking about putting just some videos up of some easy stuff to do at home, just to start opening up some pathways in your body. So like if you, you, you need to get hot and sweaty before you do it, get your heart rate up so the blood can pump, but just some easy stuff like five minute videos here and there to show you how to open your hips a little bit. If that's something you'll want, let me know. It's not Ashtanga yoga. I'm going to have to make that very clear. Just let me know down in the comment section below and I will try to figure out how to do that. So <laughs> um, anyway, I know I did that. I got so many comments, Stephanie, on our last video when I talked about the hip opening on Twitter, I got a lot of comments about, um, you can, I'll show you, you can bring the sole of your foot to your ear. That means that you can get your, your, your leg behind your head. So I can show you guys more of that kind of stuff to open that, that ball and hip socket to get it actually moving and pliable. So, all right, ladies. Thank you, Bryce. Thank yeah, you. Thank you Bryce. And, and, and uh, see you guys, I'll be back in Atlanta. Awesome. Not in a bed. Not in a bed. <laughs> Although I do film from my bedroom. Like that is my bedroom that I'm building in. So i actually faced my bed so um, me, yeah yeah this is my my third my third filming in a bed so i know my parents are probably so proud right now <laughs> <laughs> so all right ladies well we will talk to, oh and on my channel you guys all of their links are down in the description box below so make sure if you are not following eva or stephanie make sure that you give them a follow and we will talk to you guys soon bye bye, bye.